Good morning, everyone. Uh, this morning, uh, we have a, a double title, actually, The Glory of the New Covenant, and then I have a kind of a secondary title uh, on disputable matters that I want to end up with. I wanted to talk about the New Covenant and the glory of it. Some of you may not even know what I'm talking about, but the Hebrew Roots Movement. Uh, I've kind of been around it since uh, the late 1990s. And basically, there's not a denomination, there's not a central group. Uh, there's groups here and there. Uh, and, and each of those different groups basically have different beliefs to a certain degree. Uh, they all probably would agree that as a, a New Covenant believer, that you need to follow the Torah. Uh, the Old Covenant, the um, Mosaic Law. Again, there's not a, a singular group or denomination, and, and like I say, some, some of the groups even don't even believe necessarily in the, in the Trinity. Some believe that you, in order to be saved, you need to follow the Torah. Others say, no, it's only by faith. But once you are saved, then you need to follow the Old Testament laws and regulations. Um, and so my, uh, back in the summer, I had uh, watched uh, six videos, and uh, there was a lot of good stuff in it. Uh, I got, you know, some things out of it, and it was, it was you know, that positive. But I would also say at the same time, I, uh, the premise of it I disagree with, which is that, as New Covenant believers, that we need to follow uh, the Torah uh, for sanctification uh, or just for our own holiness. Uh, and so what I would encourage any of you who, and I know we've had several people in here who've watched those, is, you know, anytime there's a controversial subject, uh, like I could get up one Sunday and teach on uh, Calvinism, predestination, and then the next Sunday come up, and preach upon Arminianism or free will. Uh, and that's why we have such a, a division of churches, denominations uh, made up of, of one group that believes in one side of that and the other group believes in this side of it. Uh, and so anytime you have a, a situation like that, or even to say uh, eschatology, study of end times, we can have different views on the end times and how it's going to all play out. Uh, it doesn't mean that we have to be, you know, divide or have separation because of our different beliefs. And in this case, I would encourage each of the, you who have watched those videos uh, to look at both sides. And so I would encourage you, there's a, a pastor by the name of uh, Mike Winger, it's uh, W-I-N-G-E-R, and if you just put Mike Winger Hebrew Roots, uh, into Rabbi Google, it will come up and show, and he has a group of four videos that he's done, kind of an expose of the Hebrew Roots Movement, and that will give you a little more information, and uh, for some of you who don't know anything, you could, like I say, watch both sides, but we always need to look at both sides of an issue before we come to a place where we're making a decision, okay, this is where I'm going to have my conviction, and this is where I'm going to stay. Now, because of that, because of the, the potential uh, that could cause division or could cause issues, that's why the second part of this is on disputable matters, which is going to be out of Romans chapter 14, uh, which basically tells us how we can have different uh, beliefs. You know, obviously, our core beliefs weren't changed but different beliefs, different convictions, and then how we can still be one body, uh, loving each other, and respecting each other's beliefs. So I want to start kind of uh, where Scott left off uh, with Hebrews chapter 8. And I'm going to be going through uh, quite a few scriptures here. So if you can look up Hebrews chapter 8, and actually what I'm going to be doing, I'm going to go almost kind of in a way, backwards, uh, as we're working from Hebrews towards uh, the book of Acts. But we're going to start in Hebrews chapter 8. And again, if you remember, uh, Scott was talking about the, the 
quoted out of the Old Testament with where it was talking about the, uh, the new covenant that was coming and how the Spirit was going to be put, and he would write up on our hearts. And I want to look at kind of where he left off in verse 8, chapter, chapter 8, verse 13. And I'm going to just kind of let the, this, the Scriptures just speak for themselves. But verse 13 says, By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete. And what is obsolete and aging will soon disappear. And if you go on up the same chapter in, in verse 6, it says, But the ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is a, mediate, a mediator, is superior to the old one, and is founded on better promises. So again, just the comparison between the, the old covenant and we, there's different language we can use. We can use the Mosaic Covenant, the Sinai Covenant, or we can use the Torah, uh, all meaning basically the same thing. So I want to go to Hebrews chapter 9, since you're right there, and verse 10. And after giving uh, throughout chapter 9, he's talking about the, you know, the way the worship was set up, how the temple was set up, how the offerings were given, but... And then as you come to verse 10, it says, Now they are only a matter of food and drink and various ceremony, ceremonial washings. There are external regulations applying until the time of the new order. And again, the time of the new order is the time of the coming of the new covenant. So, I, I, like I said, we're going to kind of look at just Quick scriptures as we go through. I want to go to the book of Ephesians. So a couple books to your left if you're in your Bible. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. And we're going to look at verses 14 and 15. Verse 14. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by abolishing in his flesh the law of the Torah with his commandments and his regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two, making peace. And there he's talking about between the Jew and the Gentile by abolishing in his flesh the commandments, the law, the commandments, and the regulations. Now, Galatians is the book right, the book right next to you, to your left, the next book going towards them, back to Acts. And the whole book of, of Galatians, the, the main purpose of, of Galatians is Paul founded the church of, of Galatia. And as you remember, at the beginning... Uh, the church was made up almost exclusively of Jews. So as time began to go by and more and more Gentiles began to come into church, uh, things began to change. The, uh, uh, the Jews went from a majority to a minority during that time throughout the book of Acts. And as Paul had founded the church in Galatia, and then he's writing this letter because of an issue that's come up and what scholars call the Judaizers, which basically means these were Jewish Christians and they have come in and they have told the Galatians, okay, it's great that you're, you know, you're part of the body now, but you need to follow the Torah. You need to follow the commandments of the Old Testament. You need to follow the Mosaic Covenant. And so Paul comes very strongly, and like I say, this is the main subject of the whole book of Galatians, so I'd encourage you to read the whole book. But we're going to look at a few different examples. Chapter 1, we're going to look at verses 6 to 10, because he says, I am astonished that you are quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion 
and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we, or an angel from heaven, should preach a gospel other than the one we have preached to you, let him be eternally condemned. As we have already said, so now I say again, if anyone preaches to you a gospel other than what you have accepted, let him be eternally condemned. Am I now trying to win the approval of men or God, or am I trying to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. So he comes pretty strongly against the Galatians and what has happened. Now look at verses, or chapter 2, and we're going to look at verses 11 through 21. And this is when, uh, actually in Antioch, where Paul is telling what happened there. He said, when Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he was clearly in the wrong. Before certain men from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision party. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy, so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. Now, when I saw they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter, in front of them all, you are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? We who are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners know that man is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by observing the law, because by observing the law, no one will be justified." If why we are seeking to be justified in Christ, it became evident that we ourselves are sinner, does that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. If I rebuild what I destroyed, I prove that I am a lawmaker, a lawbreaker. For through the law, I died to the law so that I may live for Christ. I have been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me. So he comes on very strongly against Peter because up to that time, Peter had been living like a Gentile. In other words, he had not been keeping uh, kosher food laws. And then once some uh, other disciples from James came, all of a sudden he changed and, and refused to eat with the Gentiles and, and was, was again following the Jewish uh, dietary laws, and then Paul confronts him. Now, chapter 3, we just go on, 1 through 5, says, You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by observing the Torah, or by believing what you heard. Are you so foolish, after beginning with the Spirit, you are now trying to attain your goal by human effort? Have you suffered so much for nothing? If it really was for nothing, does God give you the Spirit and work miracles among you because you observe the Torah, or because you believe what you heard? So to me, that seems, seems pretty clear, but I know some of the uh, objections would be, well, uh, Paul is not talking about the Torah when he's talking about, he's talking about the extra-biblical laws that some of the uh, uh, Pharisees had put, uh, in other words, not talking about the Torah. But I think if you read through and all the study that I've done through different scholars, they all say the same thing, that no, he's talking about the Mosaic Covenant, he's talking about the Torah, he's talking about uh, the Sinai Covenant. 
So to me, it, it, it's pretty clear of the glory of the new covenant. Now in Galatians 3, verses 19 to 25, we're going to pick it up again. What then was the purpose of the law? Because that brings a question. Well, then why? Why was the Torah given? It was added because of transgressions until the seed, and we know the seed is Christ, to whom the promise was referring has come. The Torah was put into effect through angels by a mediator. A mediator, however, does not represent just one party, and God is one. Is the law, therefore, opposed to the promise of God? Absolutely not. For if a law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness would certainly have come by the law. But the scripture declares that the whole world is a prisoner of sin. So what was promised, being given through faith in Jesus Christ, might be given to those who believe. Before this faith came, we were held prisoners by the Torah, locked up until faith should be revealed. So the law of the Torah was put in charge to lead us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Now that faith has come. We are no longer under the supervision of the Torah. So again, to me, it, it just seems pretty clear through that passage. Now, one more in Galatians, and that's Galatians chapter 5. And we're going to look at verses 1 through 15. So it's a longer passage, but it's good to read, I think. So he says, Paul says, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm, then, and do not let yourself be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. Mark my words, I, Paul, tell you, that if you let yourself be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to everyone who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. You who are trying to be justified by law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. But by faith, we eagerly wait through the Spirit the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressed through love. Now you were running a good race. Who cut in on you and kept you from obeying the truth? That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. A little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. I am confident in the Lord that you will take no other view. The one who is throwing you into confusion will pay the penalty, whether he may be. Brothers, if I am still preaching circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been abolished. As for these agitators, I wish they would go the whole way and emasculate themselves. You, my brothers, are called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. The entire law is summed up in a single command. Love your neighbor as yourself. So the whole law is summed up in that one commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. We also know that Jesus gave that same admission that Yeshua said that all the commandments and all of the law, all the prophets hang on those two commandments, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and to love your neighbor as yourself. If you will do that, you will, commit, you will fulfill the entire law and commandments. So love is the source. And actually, the law of the Spirit is a higher, not only higher, it's actually a harder. Because uh, it, when you go to the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus said, you have heard it said, 
you shall not commit adultery. But I say, if you even look upon a woman to lust for her, you have committed adultery in your heart. You have heard it said, you shall not commit murder. But he says, I say, if you even say raka to your brother, you have committed murder. And so that the standard didn't go down, it actually goes higher. It's a higher standard that we're called to. All right, so as we're working our way back, let's go to 2 Corinthians, just the next book to your left. Chapter 3. That's a familiar verse. Chapter 3, I'm going to start with verse 6. Okay, verse 6 says, He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant. Now, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit gives life. Now, if the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory, so that the Israelites could not steadily Look at his face of Moses because of his glory, fading though it was. Will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? If the ministry that condemns men is glorious, how much greater glory is the ministry that brings righteousness? For what was glory, glorious has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. And if that what was fading... Away came with glory. How much greater is the glory which lasts? So comparison of the, of the old covenant and the new covenant and how much glorious it is. Verse 12. Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We are not like Moses who would put a veil over his face to keep the, keep the Israelites from gazing at it while the radiance was fading away. But their minds were made dull, for to this day the veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has been removed because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we who are with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So we're all being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory. As we give ourselves to the Lord, we continue to, to sanctify ourselves. We continue to become more and more like him. As we decrease, he increases within us. All right, we're going to Romans chapter 3. Book of Romans chapter 3, one verse there. Verse 20, and this is, a, again, a very familiar verse. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the Torah. Rather, through the Torah, we become conscious of sin. So that was one thing of the purpose of the Torah, of the commandments, was that we would become conscious of sin, that we know right from wrong. Now, in Romans chapter 7, a couple pages over, verse 6. And he's talking about the law of the Torah. In verse 6, he says, But now, by dying to what once bound us, we have been released from the law or from the Torah, so that we serve in a new way of the Spirit, and not in the way of the written 
code. So it's again, it's, it's by the way of the Spirit. We each have the Holy Spirit within us. And that Holy Spirit is supposed to lead us into all righteousness. You know, there's they 613 laws in, in the Torah. But they don't cover every situation of modern life. And that's why you need the Holy Spirit to make decisions for you in situations that aren't covered. We have to be led by the Spirit. One last one in, in Romans chapter 10, verse 4. It says, Christ, Yeshua, is the end of the law of the Torah, so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes, again, by faith. So we see this whole theme going through, through the New Testament. And it finally, it finally comes to a head in Acts chapter 15, because this has been going on actually for a period of years. And so turn to Acts chapter 15. And it, as you go through the book of Acts, which is the, the story of the early church, which, uh, which covers probably 25, 30 years, period, from the beginning of the church till uh, the end of the book of Acts, and you will see as you go through it, you don't see one, uh, one ad endorsement or one uh, command that we need to follow the Torah or that we need to follow the dietary laws or the festivals. And so it comes to a point in chapter 15, because this has been going on, we're going to read through this passage, it's a little longer, but you're going to get the, the, you know, again, this comes to a head at this place in chapter 15. So let's start with verse 1. It says, Some men came down from Judah to Antioch. Now they were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the customs taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. This brought Paul and Barnabas into a sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed along with some of the other believers, to go to Jerusalem to see the apostles and the elders about this question. Now the church sent them on their way, and they, so they traveled to Phoenicia and Samaria. They told how the Gentiles had been converted, and this news made all the brothers very glad. Now when they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders to whom they reported everything God had done for them. And by the way, all the, the elders, at, still at this time, all the elders, all the apostles were still Jewish. Verse 5, Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, The Gentiles must be circumcised and required to obey the law of Moses. Now the apostles and the elders met to consider this question. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago, God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as he did to us. Now, he made no distinction between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of the disciples a yoke that neither we nor our fathers have been able to bear? No, we believe it is through grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved, just as they are. Now the whole assembly became silent as they listened to Barnabas and Paul Talk, telling about all the miraculous signs and wonders God had done among the Gentiles through them. Now, when they finished, James spoke up. Brothers, listen to me. Simon has described on how at first showed his concern by taking from the Gentiles a people for himself. Now, the word of the prophets are in agreement with this, that it is written, 
After this, I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. Its ruins I will rebuild, and I will restore it. That the remnant of men who seek the Lord, and all the Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord who does these things, that have been known for ages. Verse 19. It is my judgment, therefore that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write to them by telling them to abstain from foods polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from the meats of strangled animals, and from blood. For Moses has been preached in, in every city from the earliest times and is read in the synagogue of every Sabbath. So he gave them these instructions because there are synagogues in most cities, and so not to bring offense by following these sets of rules. Now, there's actually a lot more than that if you go to the New Testament, throughout the New Testament. Again, all the moral laws of the Old Testament are confirmed in the New Testament. But so they ended up writing a letter, sending this letter to all the churches, uh, basically confirming what their decision had been. And so again, this had come to a head after this had been going on for, for many years. So, we come to this place, okay, if we have different understandings, our beliefs, our convictions, how do we handle that? Now that's where we go to the second part, which is Romans chapter 14. So let's go ahead and just turn over there. Because I have, who, I have friends, very good friends, who, uh, who actually follow many of the uh, Torah teachings. They're my brothers and sisters in Christ. And while I uh, confirm the, the new covenant, at the same time, uh, over dis and I like what the NIV uses as disputable matters. So we're going to start in verse 1 of that chapter, and we're going to go through verse 23. And it says, Accept him whose faith is weak, without passing judgment on disputable matters. Now one man face allows him to eat everything, but another man whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. The man who eats everything must not look down on him who does not, for the man who does not eat everything must not, must not condemn the man who does, for God has accepted him. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? Now to his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. Now, one man considers one day more sacred than another. Another man considers every day alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. He who regards one day as special does so to the Lord. He who eats meat eats to the Lord, for he has given thanks to God and he who abstains does so to the Lord and give thanks to God. For none of us live to himself alone, and none of us die to himself alone. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. Now for this very reason, Christ died and returned to life, so that he might so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. You then, why do you judge your brother? Or why do you look down on your brother? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, As surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me, and every tongue will confess to God. So then, each of us will give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another, 
Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in your brother's way. As one who is in the Lord Jesus, I am fully convinced that no food is unclean. But if anyone regards something as unclean, then for him it is unclean. If your brother is distressed because of what you eat, you are no longer acting in love. Do not, by your eating, destroy your brother for whom Christ died. Do not allow what you consider good to be spoken as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and approved by men. Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. Do not destroy the works of God for the sake of food. All food is clean, but it is wrong for man to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. It is better not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything else that will cause your brother to stumble. Verse 22, so whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is a man who does not condemn himself by what he approves, but the man who has doubts is condemned if he eats, because his eating is not from faith, and everything that does not come from faith is sin. So by reading that whole chapter, we see that we have freedom in Christ. We have freedom in Christ to do. We have freedom in Christ not to do. You know, for my, let me give you an example. In, in, in my own life, I have a conviction uh, not to drink alcohol. Now, there's nothing really in the Word of God that says you can't have alcohol. There are some, I've heard preachers that actually say that, though, that, well, it wasn't actually alcoholic, the wine. But no, it was alcoholic. But, uh, yeah, otherwise it wouldn't be saying don't get drunk at your, your feast, right? So that's a personal conviction that I have, but I can't, I don't put that on anybody else. That's for me, that's just between me and the Lord. And I think for each of us, we need to have our own convictions to be thoroughly convinced. And at first, again, I think you need to look at both sides of any argument and come to a decision, study them out, and figure out, okay, Lord, what are you saying for me? What is this, what are you telling me? You know, when I was, uh, again, in, in the Baptist church, and, and obviously Baptists aren't too hot on the gifts of the Spirit and baptism of the Holy Spirit and all that. And as we came into understanding about that, we began to do a study in our own, and that's what we did. I, I've told this story before, but we, we got some books against, we got some books for, and we got the Bible, and we looked up all the Scriptures until we came to a place where we were fully convinced that, yes, this is for today, and this is right. And then once we made that decision, we began to pursue that. And I think on so many issues in the body of Christ where you have more than one opinion, then you need to have grace for others, and you need to look, again, at both sides of an issue. Because if you're just driving one, you know, one direction, then that's what people are going to believe. So you need to look at both sides sides of the issue. And again, I, I, I believe that the law of the Spirit is not only a higher law, but it's actually a harder law, because it goes to the motives of our hearts. It's not a fulfilling a regulation. You know, it's like when Jesus went to the, you know, the young rich ruler came to him, and he said, you know, what must I do, you know, to inherit eternal life? And, and the Lord he, he listed some of the, you know, the commandments. You should not commit adultery. You should not murder. You should not honor your father and mother. And he said, I've done all those since I, was a, since I was a kid. And he says, you lack one thing, you know, sell, sell your belongings and come follow me. 
Well, there's nowhere in the Torah that says you have to sell all your belongings, come follow him. But Christ knew his heart, and he knew what was hindering him, and he went away sad. So we need to be led by the Spirit. And again, we need to have that place where we have freedom. When you come to a place of conviction, that you don't put that conviction on anyone else, it's between you and the Lord. And if someone has freedom in Christ, then you don't, you don't try to express that on someone else who does have a conviction about a certain thing. And so, in that way, you can keep division from coming in the body. So we need to be, again, looking at both sides. We need to have grace for each other. We need to have understanding and look at the whole entire scriptures and study it all out for yourself because eventually you're going to be the one who's responsible. You know, you're going to stand before the Lord on that day. And so we all need to have our convictions firmly grounded in the scriptures. All right, let's go ahead and stand. So, Lord, I just thank you for this day. I, I thank you for, Lord, your word, and, and your word is truth. And, Lord, I just ask that you would just give this people a discerning heart, discerning mind, to say what you're saying. Lord, and to truly be led by the Spirit. Lord, your word says the Spirit will lead us into all truth. So we say, Holy Spirit, show us, lead us, guide us, keep us from uh, Lord, error. Lord, keep us from deception. Lord, that our mind and our hearts and our eyes would be upon you, that you would be our magnificent obsession. We love you, Lord. We give you our hearts. We give you our minds. We give you all that we are, Lord. And we ask right now, Lord, for that spirit of unity across this body, that anything the enemy would try to come and bring division, we bind that thing in Jesus' name. We say we are one person, one man, one woman. We are one in Christ Jesus. And we proclaim your glory. We proclaim that prayer of Jesus in John chapter 17 where he says that we would be one as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are one. So, Lord, we ask for your covering over this body. We ask for your blessing and prospering of this body that we would have grace and understanding. And we give you the praise and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen.